Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on the last day of reInvent. Hopefully, you didn't have too much fun last night at Replay. Uh, out of curiosity, a uh, show of hands, uh, how many of you have maybe pre-trained a foundation model or uh, done multi-node distributed training out of curiosity? Anybody? Awesome. Awesome. This will be really relevant for you. Uh, we're so glad you're here today. Um, we're going to be introducing you to SageMaker Hyperpod. Um, I'm here joined today with, uh, or, sorry, my name's Ian Gibbs. I'm a product manager with Amazon SageMaker. I'm joined today with PY uh, and Mario Lopez Ramos. Unfortunately, our customer speaker today, Guillaume Salou, could not make it uh, from Hugging Face, so the wonderful Mario is filling in for him. To get things started, we wanted to kind of illustrate the overall computational demands that are coming at us for uh, large-scale foundation model training. It's certainly been a crazy year with generative AI, but those of us on the, found, on the training side of things, it's been more like a few crazy few years. Uh, there's been a huge amount of growth in the technology and the space, largely due to the advent of transformer model architectures. And these new architectures are really driving uh, increased demand for computational power in order to train these sorts of models. The growth has been un extremely unusual, and we've developed a new product that we'll be talking about today, Hyperpod, um, that addresses a lot of these co core concerns for how you go about training these models. Starting foundation model uh, development can be a really complicated process. You need to collect data, you need to create clusters uh, to process that data across all of the uh, distributed working worker nodes. Um, you need to develop code to distribute that workload across all those workers. Um, it requires scale. Uh, that's in order to process the model in a reasonable amount of time and train the model. Oftentimes, uh, the scale requirement um, is a fixed, uh, fixed limitation on training these models. In other words, uh, you might require 128 nodes with a few thousand GPUs, and if any one of those nodes goes down or is unavailable, you're kind of stuck. Um, and furthermore, when training these models, um, it's really critical to iterate on model design. Often we work with a lot of research organizations who are developing new model architectures, perhaps new methods of how uh, to optimize distributed training, and they really need to dive deep on uh, the tech stack and how they want to train the model and customize various layers of the tech stack to do so. Uh, along the way, we're also saving model checkpoints um, because we might be it, you know, changing things on the fly, as I mentioned, we're iterating, we might be swapping out optimizers, we might be changing the learning rate or batch size, and that's a very iterative process. So we're constantly stopping and starting and reloading from checkpoints. And lastly, I mentioned earlier, we also may need to remediate hardware issues that are, again, are interrupting our overall progress in pre-training that model. I, is a, been kind of alluding to there's some unique challenges that's, that we encounter when training models of this sort at scale. First, the cluster provisioning and management can be rather complicated. You need to find a whole bunch of you know, compute nodes. You need to network them together. They need to be able to communicate over, over a, a network uh, for all reduce and all gather operations. Um, the, you might need specialized debugging tooling or frameworks. Uh, to execute the model and train it in a, in a, you know, in a performant way. Um, and along the way, uh, the infrastructure stability becomes a real problem. Um, this is due, in fact, to the, the, the training process itself is a serial process. So again, if any one of those worker nodes that you've allocated for that distributed training job is going down, you're going to be stuck. Um, and you might be stuck for weeks or, I'm sorry, hours or days uh, every, you know, per hardware failure uh, that occurs. And that can be a real problem for delivering new models to the market. Furthermore, uh, how you actually uh, tr you know, get optimal performance can also be a, a real bottleneck. Um, in particular on AWS, we want to ensure that you are getting the most optimal performance on our network uh, for cross-node communications. Um, and, and this can be uh, really critical for improving overall time to train. So, what we'll be talking about is a little bit around infrastructure stability and distributed training performance and how that's supported with SageMaker Hyperpod. So there are three main areas of SageMaker Hyperpod 
um, that provides benefits to customers' training foundation models. One is that we provide a resilient training environment. So the clusters that you can provision with HyperPod are self-healing. If there is a hardware failure, HyperPod will automatically recover from that failure, reload from the last checkpoint, and resume training, all without any customer intervention required. At scale, this can reduce training time by up to 20%. In addition, we also provide access to SageMaker's distributed training libraries, which are optimized for AWS networking infrastructure and can provide an improvement on training or reduce training time again by another 20%. And lastly, the user experience, as I've been kind of alluding to, around the need to iterate and control multiple layers of the tech stack when you're in the training environment is really critical for rapid iterations on model design. The ability to start and stop jobs with low latency, SSH to any cluster instance, install whatever frameworks, debugging tools, software libraries, custom optimizations are needed for training those models are really critical for a lot of the customers developing these. So let's take a look at a few examples of customers who have been using SageMaker HyperPod in a private preview for a few months prior to our recent GA launch. One of which is Stability AI, which is a leading open source generative AI company. Their big challenge was they were losing hundreds of hours to hardware failures. They were, again, were interrupting their team's development cycles, largely as a distraction to their core work, which is innovating on model design. Their researchers don't want to spend time and wasting, wasting hours and days waiting for the cluster to be, uh, cluster to be repaired. Um, so instead, HyperPod automatically replaces instances for them uh, once detected. And overall, this saved Stability AI 50% in training time and cost. Another story is about Perplexity AI. They are the first conversational Q&A engine um, that's been available. Uh, their challenge was low throughput of LLM training experiments. So again, here on the, on the training performance side of things, the SageMaker distributed training libraries uh, are optimized for breaking up and distributing that workload in terms of model parallelism and data parallelism across the cluster worker nodes. And it's been optimized for TensorFlow and PyTorch. You can use these with minimal code change and Perplexity AI found a lot of benefit in doing this, and they were able to increase their experiment throughput by 2x. It's been a really big change for them. Hugging Face has also been one of our great partners in using this product. Their researchers need to, again, need to be able to dive deep into the tech stack. They have custom optimizations for the distributed training of their foundation models. Um, it's really critical that in terms of providing a managed service that we enable the customer to innovate without fear or that there's a managed infrastructure that's going to get in their way. And so we provide the ability for Hugging Face to customize a variety of aspects around it, including frameworks, containers, debugging tools, and installing whatever software libraries they need in their training environment. So this enables customers to directly interact with the training environment, customize it for their need, but it doesn't, it's not providing a level of abstraction that can get in the way for them. So for Hugging Face, that provided them and their researchers the ability to innovate with it, the freedom to innovate quickly. Having said all that, I'm gonna turn it over to PY, who's gonna talk, take you a little bit more in depth on HyperPod. Thank you, Jan. My name is Pierre Ivaculanti. People call me PY, uh, so I've got a long name. And we are gonna, I'm gonna go in depth in HyperPod and tell you a bit more what's under the covers. So um, HyperPod is built for three things. Performance, resilience, and use, use, uh, usability, but also the flexibility, customization. What we mean by performance is that we took the best architectures that we, or, you know, we identified optimized architectures that customers were using and also that are standard in the industry that uh, are composed of different services in AWS that we have uh, uh, aggregated together 
to build uh, products that you can easily use uh, to run your distributed training workloads. We are using Amazon EC2 for compute. You can use, for example, P5, P4D, P instances for training or Trainium instances. You, we also provide EFA to interconnect those instances so you can train your models in parallel. And we also include FSX for Luster that you can spin up and connect to your cluster. So you can load, for example, your data sets or, for example, store your checkpoints. You can also obviously use S3 and other services. So depending on, on, uh, on your needs. And on top of that, we do provide SageMaker optimized libraries for distributed training, so SMP and SMDPP, which will provide additional performances when training your, your models. In terms of resilience, so we know that you know, one of the top concerns in the industry when working with customers, they often tell us, you know, what's, you know, tell, tell us, you know, can, are we gonna get interrupted? And in fact, we, we know it does, it does happen, not often, but when it happens, that's dramatic. You, we'll talk more about that later and how we address that in, in, uh, in more depth. But we, that's something that we have uh, taken at heart in solving. So the cluster can self-heal, but also the jobs will resume in, um, so to, to minimize interruption time and also interruption in, when, during the training, time, uh, training uh, process. And then in terms of ease of use and flexibility, we uh, allow customers, I mean, you, you have the possibility on your uh, Hyperpod to customize your stack, whether it is libraries, where there are, there are system settings, where uh, your models, your frameworks, uh, you can run, um, build your own customizations like you would do, for example, if you were running on your own machine. Um, you can SSH into nodes, for example, if you need to gain more insights. And you can also install additional <laughs> monitoring or additional tools that may um, be, you know, that you may use, for example, during uh, your, um, um, your, your um, training. So let me um, sh t tell you a bit more about how we actually create Hyperpose. The process is, in fact, um, we could say um, fairly straightforward. You will first create your VPC, you will, um, your network, your subnet, and so on, which we assume you'll um, you, uh, we, we will be um, needing in that case to, for example, store, to set your storage. So for example, if you need a shared uh, parallel file system like FSX for Luster, or if you need to you know, um, store, for example, to, to set up your uh, a specific database on a server or else, then you will uh, create the cluster by, by first pushing what we call um, lifecycle scripts. These are scripts, so bash files that you can execute. You can also include Python files that will be called by those bash files to customize your cluster. That can be, for example, users, you know, if you need uh, to create users for a whole team, or install specific applications, run some customizations on, on the system as well, some specific settings that you may, um, uh, you may use. And then once you're doing that, you will define a configuration file where you de define two parts, so let's say a few parts. So the main part would be the head node, that is actually um, the instance on which you're connecting through SSH, your users will be connecting, to submit their jobs, to interact also with their files, and then they will, uh, you will define what we call the compute nodes, to, and, and they are, you know, define which kind of compute nodes you want. So in that case, these are P5s, but you could as well, for example, use P4 instances as, uh, uh, also. And you will define where your cycle scripts, so where those customization scripts will, um, are stored, so here in S3. And in that case, uh, Hyperpod will um, install them upon deployment, uh, I mean, run them upon deployment. Then the creation of the cluster will go through one command. So AWS SageMaker create cluster, if I'm not mistaken. And um, you will create your cluster. We will take care of spinning up resources, connecting, uh, um, for example, your FSX for Luster, execute your lifecycle scripts. So if you want to install software, such as it could be, could be Conda, um, and, uh, or you know, PyTorch. And then it is for the users to connect uh, via SS, uh, the systems manager to, your, to their cluster. And they can also connect to individual nodes if necessary, 
that can be for debug, or troubleshooting, investigation, because there may be some files located there as well. And in practice, it does actually look like that. So your administrator or um, DevOps admin um, will um, create your, your um, in, in that case, your file system, so your FSX for Luster file system, call the endpoint, so the SageMaker Hyperpod endpoint, and spin up the cluster. In that case, as you're seeing, you'll have the head node. That's the node on which you will connect through SSH as a user. And you will, in fact, interact through the head node by um, submitting your jobs. And in fact, the scheduler in, um, for Hyperpod is um, Slurm. It's uh, an HPC batch scheduler that will allow you to submit your jobs and actually has many ways to, to interact um, um, when running workloads. And I'll, I'll go through that. So there is, um, so, but before that, I'll talk about customization. So you can customize, as shared earlier, your uh, cluster through lifecycle scripts. So these are deployed when you are creating the cluster that allow you to have consistency. For example, if you need to deploy clusters across a company, across teams, you can use, let's say, specific settings, uh, user IDs, and so on. They, will, they are, are executed upon creation. Once you have created your, uh, your cluster, so if you need to run, for example, your, your, um, your training or some workloads on the cluster, you can use, for example, containers. That can be either Docker, or we also um, can use, for example, Pixis and Enroute, um, which are developed by NVIDIA, and we'll convert a container file into a squash file. It can be, so it's a flat file that will be stored, for example, in a shared um, um, file system that on which every node can, can actually, every node can access this, uh, this uh, container. So you do not need to send files over across multiple nodes. They all have access to the same file system. And then the last option uh, will be the use of a shared file system. For example, Luster, that can be also ZFS, ZFS. For example, for Luster using FSX for Luster, or we also do provide um, FSX for ZF, uh, ZFS. And you, will, um, you can store your applications here. So for example, in the HAPS directory, you can have also a file system that is just only for data, and a file system that can be only for checkpointing, or just a file system that you know, gathers, gathers them all. And of course, you can connect um, FSX for Luster, to, for example, to S3, and have your, um, your data, um, um, data set stored in S3, retrieve them, when training, either using the lazy loading uh, functionality, or you can actually pre-cache, so pre-fetch files, which we would recommend typically for performance reasons. So, and um, let's let's talk actually uh, about um, the different ways you will interact, in fact, uh, through Hyperpod, so using Slurm. So the first one is the obvious batch file. So you create a file, say it's like a menu. You say I want for example, uh, 16 instances, or I can, let's say, I want 16 instances and I want to use eight GPUs per instance, and then I want an exclusive use of these machines, of those 16 instances. So no one else is gonna run on them. There will not be any noisy neighbor, for example. Uh, your colleague is not gonna run some pre-processing workload and impact your training performances. And it's fairly straightforward in the sense that you declare your resources and then the command that you'd like to run. For example, in that case, that can be srun, python train, or that can be another command depending on the framework. The other option would be for you to allocate, uh, carve a section of, uh, of the cluster. So you, you take those, let's say, 16 nodes, just for yourself, for the duration of an alloc allocation, which can be time-bounded or unlimited. And you would carve this section to Easier to develop interactively, troubleshoot interactively, maybe to reproduce or troubleshoot issues that you cannot see except if you run it you know, at scale because of maybe the model size or it can be because it would take too much time to, um, to do it on lesser resources, uh, a smaller set, subset of resources. And then you can relay, release those resources, when, so this allocation, when you are done. And another way to use Hyperpod is to make use of frameworks. 
So there are some integration that exist already, for example, using PyTorch Lightning, we slurm, so PyTorch Lightning, the Nemo launcher, if you use NVIDIA Nemo, but also submit it from uh, Facebook research, as well as Ray and Mosaic ML, so Composer. We do, in fact, also provide examples um, that we will communicate in a few more slides uh, that you can use for you to kickstart for uh, your, your hyperpower journey. And the way it works in practice is that, for example, a user A will be submitting a job using a batch file, take a section of the, of the cluster. A user B then will submit uh, an allocation because they need to do some troubleshooting or they need to, let's say, do a bit more interactive work that may require, you know, they do not want to have a job waiting in the queue or they actually need to, do, to, to, to work interactively. And then another user could be, for example, using uh, submit a, a job, a training job, uh, using Nemo, so NVIDIA Nemo. And then let's say you have another um, um, you have another uh, user who's submitting a job uh, D. In that case, this job would be queued. But then there are also many options for you to 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 actually um, submit, let's say, run your workload. So in meaning that, for example, you can have preemption. It did happen that one of the customers that um, Jan one was referring earlier uh, is running pre-processing workloads at lesser priority that get preempted when a production job is running. Because you can resume the pre-processing, that's all right, it gets interrupted, we'll get there after. And you can do that automatically through the scheduler, so through the Slurm batch scheduler, without actually active management from the user part or the admin part. But then the key point of HyperPod is re the job failure. And how do we actually um, address that? So we know that there can be of different nature. It can be a hardware failure, that does happen sometimes. Um, um, for example, your instance connectivity can be lost. Then you can have, for example, also uh, software failures, a misconfiguration, um, so for, that, for example, on the cluster, or that can be, for example, you submitted a job and maybe some of the parameters, um, well, your, your job just ran out of memory. You may need to reconfigure it. And uh, the, the challenge is that is if you lose, let's say, one instance, these are distributed training workloads. They are tightly coupled. It means that the whole job is going to crash. It means that 16 instances, so 16 nodes, well, are just going to um, lose their job. And you know, what do you do here? Um, it may require, so this capacity may still idle because you cannot actually run you know, lesser jobs. You carved your capacity, your job, and your settings to say, I need those 16 instances and that many GPUs uh, to, to run my job. And less, I need to recompute my, uh, rebuild my compute budget, so it may impact my ability to deliver within a certain time frame. And this is a real story that we've seen for some, from some customers. And then the time that it may require to debug. Is that a software issue? Is that a hardware issue? And what we do is actually we, we um, isolate this by um, deploying, so we have actually um, um, agents that will detect those failures. And instead of going through this long process of investigating the issue, restoring and replacing, that may take sometimes you know, a few hours, a few minutes, if you really know where to look for, up to certain two days I've seen in some cases. And we do replace that by an automated process, so this agent, that will take care of not only detecting if there is a failure, but then replacing the instance or rebooting the instance if, you know, uh, upon, upon this failure to ensure that it will, your job can run, can resume, and your work continue, your training continue. And the way it does work in practice is for the ones uh, on the software side for um, the job resume, is that we, you would be checkpointing, for example, every 1,000 iteration, let's say, on a, on a regular basis. We'll go through an alarm and then we'll re restore the instance and restore the job. And the way it will work is that you um, will have actually in your, in your files, so in your, for example, in your batch files, a series of commands, which can be pre-processing commands or also um, let your training commands, so for example, bash run train.sh, which actually is calling a SRAM, so 
in, in that case, we are submitting through uh, Slurm Python training.py. And we will first look at the checkpoint. If there is any checkpoint, get me the latest one, and then take that as an input when you are starting my job. So if you get interrupted, you start at the latest checkpoint, and you lose really minimal time and minimal interruption. There are minimal interruptions, and you don't have to go through the hassle of investigating and, and, and redeploying your workload. It is done by steps, meaning that if you have even multiple commands um, that you may run, a sequence, for example, a workflow, it will resume as a step that was interrupted. And the question that um, comes often with users is, how do I manage my software? Because we, dis we quickly mentioned that you can deploy lifecycle scripts, typically done by admins that, or DevOps, you know, the person who will operate your, your cluster. And then you will have the option to ask the user to run either containers through Docker, Conda environment, because you have a shared file system that every node can see. So you can deploy your, let's say, your application in apps or shared, and call it from any node. Every node, every node will see the same path and will have access to the same, same binaries, same libraries. It does facilitate installations. No, you don't need to redeploy everything to necessarily containers if you don't need, but you can do that as well. So all those three options are possible. And I'm sure uh, we'll see more creative ways of, uh, of running uh, software um, as time goes. And there is also one point about I, I propose that we touch. It was actually the first um, that I mentioned. It was about performance. We optimize throughout the stack, first by defining an infrastructure that encompassed the, an architecture that encompassed the best practices that we've seen coming from different, the different customers and also our most advanced customers. Meaning with EFA, uh, Amazon EC2 Ultra Cluster, Amazon EFA, Amazon FSX for Cluster, Amazon S3, which are combined into uh, Hyperpod, or you can combine into Hyperpod. Then on the software side, we are constantly optimizing libraries, including and, and developing own libraries, optimized libraries such as SMP, uh, Amazon SageMaker SMP, and uh, Amazon SageMaker SMDDP. So the um, libraries can be used through one command. You can replace for, in, in that case, that's, it is just an import. You can see here, you will import a library, and you can include it into your, I mean, set your backend, in that case, for PyTorch FSDP, to use SMDPP instead of the default backend. And that will give you a performance uh, improvement of up to 10 to 20% depending on the model and also different parameters that you would select. So there is also one point, one last point is observability. Because you know, you're running codes. These are um, computationally intensive. And you need to get some view of what is happening on the system. And sometimes troubleshoot also when an issue arises. You can use, for example, Amazon CloudWatch that will provide you with GPU metrics, GPU utilization, it can be a memory utilization. You can use all, install also Prometheus. So for example, use DCGMI, uh, DCGM, uh, the DCGM exporter from NVIDIA, or the Prometheus node exporter to get system level metric. And then you can, as a user, use TensorBoard, use DCGMI. Some users will tend to use uh, TOP as well, uh, DCGM also to get the GPU utilization. And they can also, so we are looking also for users to use a SageMaker provider so that is available on SageMaker um, so training. And then for admins, you can also use eBPF for deeper insights and also troubleshoot through different real providers. Let's say, when I say real, it's actually because they will, they will tend to slow down slightly your, um, your, your runtime, but will give you also much more, uh, I mean, the ability to get deeper metrics into your application. You can also include, for example, pointers into your code to identify um, the utilization on certain code portions, but also provide additional data, for example, um, you, that you can surface back to the provider. And these are different options that you can use on Hyperpod, and I'm pretty sure you, you will see new cases arise in the future as well. 
So with that said, I will um, um, hand over the mic to Mario, who's going to dive into the, um, the, the um, sorry, I was going to, oh, thanks, um, into the uh, case. Thank you, Pierre Yves. My name is Mario. I'm a principal solutions architect at LUS in France. And for the last couple of years, I've been supporting Hugging Face. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Guillaume Salou, the head of machine learning infrastructure at Hagen Face, could not attend today. He's flying back today. And he asked me to uh, replace him because uh, I'm familiar with their usage of AWS. So uh, first, a little bit of context about uh, Hugging Face. Um, so the, the mission of Hugging Face is to democratize machine learning. And um, it all started when uh, the Transformers architecture spun uh, lots of different models in the open source world that were solving different issues for either summarization, translation, text classification. And uh, a couple of years later, the similar thing happened with stable diffusion. It was open source text to image generation. And we saw like an explosion of open source models, slightly related, somewhat different, each with a different technique improving on some uh, of the um, of the objectives, and um, it was it, it's it's an amazing time to live, but it's been hard to uh, follow and to try to make this work uh, because each model works in a slightly different way, it has variations in the architecture and so forth. So that's where um, Hugging Face stepped in to provide a common platform to run all these models in a similar way. And there's two sides of it, right? One is the visual. Uh, part in the Hugging Face hub that most of you probably know, where you can go and browse models. You can filter by task, whether they're for image generation, for text classification, uh, speech to text, text to speech, you name it. Um, there you can check also the model cards, which are the description of the uh, machine learning models that describe how they were trained, whether they saw training data in English, French, or Spanish, or in Python or Rust, which lets you uh, pick the right model. And in addition to that, there's uh, now an uh, open uh, large language model leaderboard, uh, which ranks the dif these different models depending on their, uh, their performance, accuracy, bias, and so forth. Um, the, the other side of this uh, is the libraries that lets you point to the right model from the hub and in a couple of lines um, have something up and running for inference. So this is a simple example of how uh, easy it is to use a transformers library to perform object detection in image. And uh, the same thing goes for uh, text to image generation, right? It's just a matter of picking the right model and creating a, a diffuser's pipeline to generate an image like this. Um, Hagen Face are also working on improving the uh, inference serving stack with a text generation uh, inference. So in a, in a line of code, you can launch uh, a Docker image that will pick the right model and serve it uh, through an optimized web server written in Rust. Um, so that's it for the inference part. Uh, but in their mission to democratize machine learning, Hugging Face is also uh, working on model training. A couple of examples of uh, model training um, are uh, star coded and indefix. Um, but first, um, just to uh, for you to understand that their mission is not to come up with the next Llama or uh, the next Mistral, uh, but to put the tools in the hands of everyone to train their own models. And um, they do it by uh, working together with, uh, with the community on some of these uh, model trainings. And for instance, Starcoder um, is a code generation model, uh, similar to what you get with a GitHub Copilot or uh, with Amazon Code Whisperer. It's a 15 billion uh, parameters model uh, that supports over, uh, over 80 programming languages with a really good scores in languages such as Python. And it's an open access uh, model, which has actually been uh, created through a community effort uh, named the Big Code Project, involving over 
500 participants for, uh, from uh, three plus countries. And so anyone can join this effort to uh, build with them this, uh, this model. Another example is uh, Edifix, which is a visual language model, meaning that you can ask questions about images. And uh, there's two variants, uh, the 9 billion and the 80 billion parameters uh, variations, and it's an open access reproduction of a closed uh, Fleming model. So this is what uh, the data science team at Hagen Face uh, is doing there, um, reproducing closed source models, uh, looking at the latest techniques from research publications, implement them, and share them with the community. And for that, uh, they need a compute, right? So. Um, about a year ago, uh, Guillaume Salou, the head of uh, ML infrastructure there, um, called and said, hey, I'm gonna need uh, a cluster with uh, over 1,800 uh, uh, GPUs. Can you help? And by the way, uh, my team likes using uh, Slurm uh, jobs and uh, use a, a shared file system. So that's when I, I said, okay, uh, let me get back to you. And I, I, I contacted, uh, Pierre Yves, and uh, uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, we were all uh, at their office in Paris showing the premises of Hyperpod. Like, this is how you can create a cluster, this is how you can plug it to uh, FSX for Luster and uh, set up everything so that you can start uh, launching training jobs. And they benchmarked it, and they were happy with it, and uh, they've been using it so far. So now, um, Let's uh, look at an example of a training setup for a specific model, uh, which is Stark Order. So um, they're using a partition, so a subset of uh, the, the capacity of their cluster for this training, uh, which lets them, by the way, uh, use the rest of the GPUs for other jobs concurrently, right? Which this is one of the nice things of Hyperpod. And in this specific example, they're using uh, one trillion tokens over 24 days with 3D parallelism using Megatron LM. And um, so th this is uh, just a screenshot of um, their, um, their metrics during training. Um, what's interesting here is that they're uh, consistently reaching uh, 400 multi flops per GPU. Um, you, you can notice as well that there's a few vertic vertical lines where the performance de decreases while they are checkpointing uh, the model weights. To, uh, to persistence. And by the way, the, the way they do it is uh, first persist to the local NVMe, which is uh, super fast, and then uh, have a job that uh, sends that to S3. Uh, the training data is in, uh, in FSX for last year. Uh, this is another um, screenshot of the, the tools they have set up for uh, monitoring by uh, getting the, the, uh, the node exporter um, to send the metrics to Prometheus. And what we can see here is that they have a consistently 100% uh, GPU utilization. And the way they, they track as well the, uh, the CO2 emissions, which they care about a lot. So in, uh, in summary, for Hugging Face, why, why Hyperpod? So they have over 60 data scientists that are uh, concurrently using the cluster for many different jobs. The, um, jobs that perform the evaluation for the Opel LLM leaderboard that you see on the website are Slurm jobs that are submitted on a daily basis. Uh, there's also some training uh, jobs concurrently. So um, Hyperpod lets them all share the same uh, capacity and reach 100% digitalization, right? Because there's no, no time where there's not, not a job in the queue waiting to get capacity and uh, to, to perform some uh, computation. Um, the resilience that uh, was mentioned before was an important factor for them because they are able to quickly uh, pause and resume a training job when uh, a failure occurs and this saves them a lot of time and uh, uh, compute uh, is expensive here, right? Um, and the last but not least, um, is the fact that they could uh, really customize uh, this solution. So they can SSH into any node to debug whether something was wrong. Uh, they were able to install their own tools for, uh, for monitoring, for debugging, and uh, that's let them iterate with a lot of freedom, uh, which is what they, what they want. 
So uh, that's it for me, and now we're gonna head back for the uh, demo of autohelin in action. Thanks, Mario. So as we've been talking about, uh, SageMaker HyperPod, the managed benefits that we provide is really intended to enable customers developing these sorts of foundation models to focus on innovation, on new model architectures, new optimizations, and to, so they don't have to spend time on how to manage the infrastructure, deal with hardware failures. But we've been talking a lot about how that's going to work, but let's see, actually see it in action. Uh, so this is going to be a, a demo we're going to take a look at. Um, so this is a demo training, uh, pre-training Llama 2 with FSDP. Um, and so we've already prepared a, screening, a training script. We're going to be submitting a job using SBatch. Um, and what we're going to see here is that there's going to be, we're going to induce a hardware failure, and we're going to see how SageMaker HyperPod automatically recovers from that failure. So here we're starting to uh, submit the training job using SBatch. Um, it's going to call our training code. Um, first, we're gonna, but first, we're going to take a look at the training code. <clears throat> so this is a typical sbatch uh, kind of command with you know that includes all of our training code. Um, here, we're going to use two nodes uh, to start running this training job. This is largely used for example purposes. Um, here, we're looking at uh, the Llama 2 training parameters. Um, so what we'll be doing is uh, changing a few of them, but we'll be checkpointing every 100 steps. Um, and we'll see how that kind of, uh, how that uh, is resumed uh, in a little bit later uh, through the auto healing feature. Um, to enable the auto resume uh, for this particular workload, we're gonna add auto, uh, you know, auto resume equals one. That will tell HyperPod that if there is a hardware failure that is detected by our agents to automatically resume that, that workload. So this is something that customers can enable or disable as they need to. So if they have data processing jobs, this may not be that relevant. Um, because resiliency is a little bit less relevant in that case, um, so that they can enable it for their, for their large-scale training runs. So we're about to submit the job. Here we already have a cluster running on HyperPod. So we have eight nodes. There's seven idle. There's one failed. Again, we're going to submit our job for two nodes. Um, so we submit the S batch to Slurm. The job is submitted, uh, and what we'll see is uh, by running sinfo again, we'll start to see that the, there's been a node, two nodes that have been allocated to it, um, and we should start to see output generated in our output file. So here we're starting to take a look at that output file, and running sinfo again, we'll see that now we have two nodes that have been allocated. Important to note that the node identifier is there, uh, listing the IP addresses. Um, what we'll see through the auto healing functionality is that a, there will be a new node that will come in. Checking the, um, so here we're kind of actually just recording uh, some information about the nodes that we started with um, at the start of the job. We're just recording those IPs. What we'll see later is we'll do a comparison and you'll see that there's a, a, now a new node that's been replaced automatically by HyperPod. So now our training job is running. We're starting to see uh, loss is decreasing. Uh, we can see all of our other training metrics as the model is kind of progressing through iterations, um, losses, again, decreasing as we would normally expect it to. Next one. So what it does is, uh, it will, uh, you, what you see is that the nodes are actually spun up. So we, we use DCGM uh, fault injection, uh, injection. You can actually um, you know, trigger failures, well, virtual failures um, in, um, in your, you know, on your GPUs. Um, and um, it will actually make HyperPod, in that case, replace those instances. So the agent will kick in, uh, start to replace instance. And then uh, Slurm will auto-resume the step when it was stopped. And thanks to the flag, so auto-resume, and I believe it's actually activated by default, if not mistaking, you can also use an environment variable. It will resume at this step. And if you, uh, if you have your checkpoints, for, for example, here, 100 steps, at every 100 steps, but that can be, let's say, 1,000, you, you are the judge of it. Uh, we'll, um, so I would say every customer would tend to, to have a different practice. You, it will resume at the last checkpoint that was saved on disk. Uh, the reason also why we do recommend, for example, for you to use um, Luster, or at least to share shared space where, or for you to push your checkpoints in a shared space, for example, that can be Amazon S3, FSx for Luster, 
you can, for example, push them to NVMe disk because of the throughput and the IOPS that they offer, then move them to S3. You can pull that back and restore your jobs, um, you know, whether you replace instances. Uh, I mean, um, uh, if, if you have to replace instances. And the way it does look on the, on the graph, so maybe, Jan, do you want to actually talk a bit about the loss curve? Because we, we do have actually uh, the visualization of the, uh, of the training process that you just saw before. Yeah, so apologies about the, the, the video, but what we would normally see is in that training run, you would start to see the loss accumulate. But then we would see when there was a hardware failure, obviously the job crashed. Um, and then, but then in the, the log output file that we would see is Hyperpods agents automatically detecting that hardware failure and executing the node replacement. These logs are admitted to CloudWatch for customers who are using Hyperpod, again, to understand what's going on with their training jobs and how Hyperpod has recovered from the failure. But in terms of how long Hyperpod takes to recover from har hardware failures, you can start to see it on this loss plot. So here we've, we've il illustrated the loss curve for that model training with Llama 2. And this is in wall time instead of step time to just kind of illustrate how long it takes. So here you can see uh, one hardware failure here uh, and then another one here. So there's two failures uh, that we've, we're showing. Um, you can see that uh, in, you know, there's initially there's a, a checkpoint save um, and those checkpoint saves are actually when there is uh, a hardware failure occurring. Um, and then we see that there's a, another section shortly thereafter where Hyperpod has brought in a new node. Um, and then you see uh, another section here where we're reloading from the checkpoint and training just resumes. Again, this is, there's no customer interaction required here. So, um, and then we see a, yet another instance available uh, subsequently uh, for hardware failures here. So on average, this uh, is resuming in a roughly a two to three minutes or so um, when there is a hardware failure. Uh, so this is in stark contrast to, for instance, some uh, speaking with a, a customer this week uh, who, again, was operating a large training cluster uh, and unfortunately encountered a hardware failure and was down for three days. And that can be really uh, a big problem for, again, for making pro progress on foundation model training, uh, especially if you're, you know, you're developing a, a foundation model in the context of bringing a new product to market. Uh, that, that amount of time can be a really big problem. Um, so again, this uh, illustrates how we can recover from that automatically. Uh, just to wrap up a bit, if you'd like to learn more uh, about Hyperpod, how to get started, we would encourage you to take a look at our service page, uh, provide some high-level information about uh, what Hyperpod can do, uh, the benefits it provides that we've been talking about today. Uh, we've also provided uh, a lot of great documentation about how to use it um, that can, is available at this link. And then we have a couple blog posts we've already put out uh, there today. There'll be more coming in the, in the near future as well about customers using Hyperpod in new and innovative ways. As you might imagine, uh, we're talking a lot about foundation model training here, but we've also been alluding to data processing, um, obviously, inference is also a, kind of an emerging use case on these sorts of environments. Um, we, so we want to support the full life cycle of machine learning model development for foundation models. And that includes data processing and inference. So while we're supporting Slurm today, um, we do expect to support other orchestrators in the future. Similar to how we are uh, trying to provide an environment that you know, allows customers to the, the freedom to innovate quickly, uh, that too, we're not terribly opinionated about what orchestrator you should use. So we support Slurm today, but we expect to support others going forward, perhaps Kubernetes or Ray. Um, and lastly, take a look at our, the, the, the announcement. And I want to call out, uh, as kind of PY mentioned, um, there is a really great repository we've created with those examples, including the one we were just looking at earlier, uh, pre-training uh, Llama 2 with FSDP. Um, there's a lot of in great information about how to architect your hyperpod, uh, key considerations and best practices for setting up that kind of a computing environment for foundation model training, uh, in addition to model training examples that you can get started with. So thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. 
Uh, I think we have any time for questions. Yep, time for questions.